Some of the clues are simply a time and location, such as this one. Leith Academy, art class, 4.30pm. Helen's gone along to discover what it's all about. I think it's time for us to get down to some serious business, babe. Feel a woman coming on. And from the deepest, darkest mouth of your compassion, I want you to push into your clay. Mm. Bowels? Movements? It would appear Clue 95 isn't, well, that subtle. I want to see some really nice crap. This is rubbish crap. <laughs> After a creative push, job done. Lots of the clues involve making stuff from scratch. Not a problem for our team though, worthy of a Blue Peter badge. With the final whistle fast approaching, it's time for all the teams to hot foot it back to the City Arts Centre and display their booty for the judges. Together. Okay, you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes left. Got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 91. Is this quite good, I think? It's alright. Some of them are a bit bulgy, but you know, it's on the spirit of it. Oh god. It turns me. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Everybody's got to clear the door immediately, please. The doors are about to be sealed. We live in a, in a winner takes all lottery culture now. And so if you get one point less, than the winning team, you get nothing. Um, and we kind of play with that a bit. I mean, when we give the money away at the end, it's very vulgar, it's purposefully very vulgar. We're giving away £2,000 worth of used notes in an unmarked briefcase. The winner of Festival Scavenger for the incredible After the teams have gone home, the huge amount of swag is then sifted and organised into a modern art exhibition which runs for a week. Who is the real winner of all of this? I mean, I hope it's me. It's purposely cheeky, but we're living in an art world now where a lot of the really big name artists don't touch their work. So here, I'm bringing that working mechanism to the fore and I'm making it really obvious. But it works both ways, because here we're saying, OK, you, you spend, you're not an artist at all, but you spend the day looking for rubbish around the city, and you can have your work exhibited in the art centre. Library, Library Rubbish. This was made in the city of Maria, which is a, a small suburban city north of Tokyo in Japan. And this is a purpose-built space, so everything that you see here is in a much larger space. It didn't exist before. And on one side, on this side, on the left, these are all books that were thrown out by the citizens of the city of Maria in one day. In Japan, when they throw out books, they wrap them up very nicely and put them out on two days per month. And I had all those books from the city delivered uh, to my studio, and I sorted them and indexed it as a library, as a conventional library. And then on the other side, I collected all the rubbish from the city library for two weeks, and I sorted it, every single little bit of it, and washed it all, and you know every pencil thing from the library was a nightmare. And uh, exhibited that. So on one side you had the rubbish library, on the other side you had a library rubbish. And then there were a series of events that took place, and they were to be, they were events that would never normally happen in uh, to be associated. There were luxury events. The first was a champagne reception, but you had to be uh, work in the rubbish industry to come to it. So it's the rubbish people of them. Then I served a traditional English afternoon tea, Japanese style. And then uh, it was opened as a luxury hotel for paying guests. They came, the first thing that happened was they received a chromatic meal. The meal went from white to black. 
<laughs> and then I entertain them with some karaoke song. <laughs> <laughs> then they slept there overnight. Uh, and then the last event we had was a book wreck where people could come and destroy a book. I had to return all the books to the recycling department to the same weight. So I could not give the books away, which is what I wanted to do, but I could transform them. So they would come and, and choose a book that annoyed them and destroy them. <laughs> Um, all right, the second section is around collections, uh, things that we choose to keep. And the first piece is uh, that I'm going to show you I made last year. It's called Object Retrieval, and this was for University College London. University College London is one of the largest research universities in the world. It's rated number four in the world for research. Um, and they have museums. Uh, there, which no one ever sees. Some of them are professorial museums, they're just somebody's cupboard. Anyway, I chose one of these objects, one object from one of the uh, many hundreds of thousands, and subjected it to analysis 24 hours a day for seven days by researchers and staff and students, as well as members of the public, um, in a route master bus, which is an old bus in the main quad of UCL. The idea was to build up one giant biography of this object, and I'm going to try and give you a little taste of what we discovered. So it was this bash and beaten, and as it turns out, eaten toy car that was the uh, unpromising specimen at the heart of object retrieval, which, as I've indicated, was a one week, 24 hour a day research project on a route master bus in the main quad of UCL. The object comes from the UCL Pathology Collection, based at the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead. I don't think anyone had bothered with it for years. It was confiscated from a child who was admitted in 1963 with lead poisoning to Great Ormond Street Hospital, founded in 1852 by Dr. Charles West. Apparently, the red paint in the car contains lead. Okay, so we can see here that he's managed to lick or chew off the white paint. But he's not done so well with the red paint. The pigment analysis conducted by geoarchaeologist Dr. Ruth Siddle showed quite a slow reaction for lead content. The scanning electron microscope analysis conducted by Dr. Emma Passmore determined that the red colour was a mixture of two types of paint. The first was dominated by the chemical PB, which stands for lead, but could easily be an acronym for page break personal best or peanut butter. <laughs> Team Emma could confirm that there was enough lead in the red paint chewed off this toy's car to poison a child. In fact, it seems pretty likely that this kid was eating all kinds of non-nutritious things because he had pica. Pica is a medical disorder characterized by an appetite for non-nutritive substances. <laughs> the condition's name comes from the Latin word for magpie, a bird which is reputed to eat almost anything. Magpies have, all, magpies have also been discovered to recognize themselves in mirrors. The toy car was probably originally kept for use as a teaching aid, but I don't think it had been taken out of storage for years. When we asked to see it, the curator didn't even know where it was, and it took ages to find it amongst all the other bits and bobs that kids had swallowed, sucked, or got stuck with. The curator refused to sing karaoke with the curator at the top deck of the Oxford <laughs> bus, but he did watch other people sing in between answering questions on the pathology collection. The child admitted to Great Ormond Street Hospital was placed under the care of Professor Alan Moncrief, a pioneer in the development of child health who was knighted for his groundbreaking work in pediatrics. There are, of course, other Sir Alans. Sister Hazel Big, nothing to do with Ronnie Biggs, remembers Sir Alan as a brilliant physician who was excellent with children. The Great Ormond Street uh, archivist at the time photographed the object, uh, which was confiscated, confiscated of the child, and gave it the index number 25063, which is a zip code gives you Clay County, West Virginia, USA. <laughs> the precise zip code, is, zip code is, in fact, Strange Creek in Clay County. Strange Creek is also, Creek is also the name of a classic southern rock and roll band. They are from the USA, which makes them non-European. The child that was also admitted to Great Ormond Street Hospital in 1963 was described as being of non-European extraction. We don't think by that that he meant he was from the USA. He was also described as being mentally retarded, which while sounding outdated is in fact the clinical definition for someone with an IQ under 70. Children with an IQ way over 70 include Lily, who can be seen here with her prototype cross between a helicopter, car, and boat, and Neil, who devised a sub-motor, which is a cross between a car, boat, VTOL, aircraft, and submarine. As you can see from this photograph, the object has been really badly mounted. 
The CT scan made by Professor Robert Spiller shows just how badly it was handled. A ruddy great screw was drilled through its bottom, rendering its wheel action, short of the main purpose of any toy car, null and void. The car was made by Tootsie Toy, the first company in the world to make and sell die-cast toys. It was called Tootsie Toy because Tootsie was the name of the daughter of one of its founders. Tootsie makes me think of Tootsie Roll and Dustin Hoffman in the <laughs> <laughs> Some of the cars are highly collectible and in their original packaging can fetch considerable sums. Car, model and design enthusiasts, as well as people who are nostalgic for their childhood, collect them. Actually, this toy car is pretty well worthless. I bought one in far better condition with the Rambler station wagon into the bargain for £2.49 off eBay. I was the only person that bothered to bid. Clearly, <laughs> everyone else in the world agrees that this is a useless object. <laughs> Except that wheezing from the increasing material suffocation of capitalism, not least in the ever growing archives of museums and galleries, perhaps we need to rethink the materiality of the object in terms of the life they have led and the context in which they are situated. Object retrieval was about showing that any object can give rise to a network of interconnected strands of knowledge and research. It could have been any other object that we chose, or for that matter, a speck of dust. As it happens, it was this toy car. Okay, I hope that gives you some uh, kind of idea of the strands of research that we were pursuing. This is a map that we made after the event, or a kind of word map, starting with a toy car in the middle and trying to, you can't read all that map, it doesn't really matter. If you're really super interested, I can send you one. Um, it's a large poster that maps basically uh, as much information as we gathered. It was gathered through a, an online database as the course that we went on. Next project about collections. Uh, this is collections in Lofoten Homes. Some of you, I'm sure, have been to Lofoten in the north of Norway. It's an extraordinary place. Uh, if you haven't been there, I promise you can go. Um, as many of you uh, are, <laughs> so it's like talking to a Scandinavian, you say that anywhere else, you go, oh, really tell me about it. No. <laughs> no, Tahiti for you guys. Okay. Anyway, as, as you may know, it's got this uh, international art fair festival there that you might also know has been in huge crisis. Um, anyway, they, the way historically it has been before 2008, um, was that it was a kind of playground for the, the rich that people would fly in and then fly out. And they wanted some way to connect up the local population with this art festival. So I started this project collection in Lofoten Homes, which my aim was to survey or open a survey that would be open to all 25,000 residents of the Lofoten Islands about what they collected. And I started off by showing one of my collections. Uh, this is a collection of postcards of the Mona Lisa. Um, the idea being that she looks different in every single image, even though it is purporting to be the same image. This postcard is also the idea of sending a postcard from abroad also kind of seemed to tie in with the fact that I was working in Lofoten as a kind of tourist. So I exhibited these in a huge long line in the gallery, and then I opened the survey and I didn't want to just exhibit other people's objects. That wasn't really what... Because although I'm very interested in collections, I'm actually interested in the way of the dematerializing of the collection, rather than the accumulation of more objects. So the first thing that we did was to have events in collectors'